Um, hi, everyone. I'm Eric Chen. I'm an independent uh, curator and writer based in Shanghai and also a professor at Tongji University and uh, curatorial director for the Design Miami Fairs. And it's really my privilege today to be uh, speaking with Kayan Lo. Now, for many people, uh, Kayan will need no introduction. Um, she is a uh, woman who's really led a remarkable life. Um, she was born and raised in Hong Kong, where she still lives uh, today. Uh, but she studied at, um, at Cambridge and in London. Um, she moved to New York uh, early on, where she worked with uh, the legendary publishing magnet, uh, Henry Luce. Uh, there, there was this famous washroom in Kayin's uh, previous home in Hong Kong that was just plastered with photos of, of Kayin with, oh, I don't remember. It was like, it was like Henry Kissinger and Jackie Onassis or, <laughs> or, or people like that. Um, uh, before coming back to, to, to Hong Kong, where she became uh, really an internationally renowned jewelry designer. And uh, since then, also a scholar of traditional Chinese furniture and domestic environments, and a, a general and overall cultural patron and ambassador, really working across cultures, geographies, um, and disciplines. Uh, I really got to know Kayin uh, when I was a curator at uh, M Plus, the Museum for Visual Culture that's opening next year in Hong Kong, um, where Kayin as a board member was really a very key supporter. Uh, Kayin uh, is also a pioneer as a collector in Asia of both 20th century and contemporary design, uh, which is what we're here to talk about today. Uh, so maybe Kayin, we can start off by asking you really how you began collecting uh, design? Well, after that glowing introduction, I better be careful. Thank you. <laughs> now, I'm a historian, a medieval European historian, which I studied at Girton College, Cambridge, and then more history at King's College, uh, London University. So my knowledge of um, Chinese history was secondary school level. So I began to gain better understanding of Chinese history through uh, investigating the Chinese way of living, the home, the family, and the house. And I wrote three books about it as I traveled throughout China, mostly in the Nekala environment. So I amassed a good collection of Chinese furniture from the 1980s, and the first book, Classical and Vernacular Chinese Furniture in the Living Environment, published in 1998, with pathfinding articles by leading experts, really drew new views and understanding to Chinese way of living. And then the next book, Vernacular Environment in China, uh, focused on regional pat patterns of the community, then came house, home, family, living and being Chinese, was my inquiry together with Professor Ron Knapp. In, it was chosen by the Association of Museum Directors USA as one of the 15 important books for understanding China. So after that, I thought I better understand, go back to Europe. That's what, what I was trained for. So as furniture is the tools of the house, so I studied its construction, furniture, I mean, function, role, and meaning in the living environment. It so happened that in 2012, I was a member together uh, on, the, on a mission to Scandinavia uh, with the Hong Kong Design Center. So it was there that I was open to a new world of furniture. So shall okay. I go on telling you about it? Well, sure, but were, were you already collecting classical Chinese furniture at this point? I collected only um, mostly Chinese furniture, Chinese yeah. classical Chinese furniture made of the good stuff, the good wood, Huang Hua Li, Zitan, Nan Bu. And then I went into vernacular furniture uh, made of lower ranking wood and which most 99% of the people in China used. Mm -hmm. So actually, um, having understood Chinese furniture, its construction and its background, I thought I better explore another system of furniture. So the Scandinavian trip availed me of my first opportunity. 
Yeah, and, and and so what was it about the Scandinavian furniture that that uh, that that really drew you in? Well, it's like Hans Wegner when he saw the brown back chair, he said, "Wow, it's a new world." And then I looked the other way. I saw the china chair and I compared it with my brown back chair, which is so much more formal, so much bigger in size. So hence the difference already I noticed. Magnus' role was to make the chair comfortable for economics for the body. The Chinese chair did not care about that. It was symbolic. It occupied always the most important space in, in, in any uh, room. And, you know, uh, when there's a family meeting, gathering, so the uh, hierarchy, I mean, the higher, higher of the hierarchy of the household will sit on it. So it's a ritual as against something that the body would rest on for comfort. Right. So you, well, and, and also, you know, the, the, the famous story with the Hans Wegner uh, China chair, as it's called now, is that, of course, uh, Wegner never actually visited China, but he was uh, struck by uh, drawings or images of, of Ming Dynasty chairs. He was struck by a photograph of a Danish merchant when, wearing a Mandarin coat, sitting on a chair that he did not understand. So he arranged to have this chair with a round back shipped to Denmark. And he said, uncomfortable, let me do my bit. So hence the China chair and evolved other variations of it. Yeah. Yeah, and, and so, I mean, uh, you, you went on to collect, uh, you know, your, your, your collection uh, is, is quite, uh, quite broad and eclectic, you know, in, in a wonderful way. Um, but there are very strong sort of narrative threads that, that, that run through it. I mean, you, you had a strategy <laughs> with your collection um, or, even an, or even an agenda in some ways. Uh, can, can you tell us a bit more about that and, and, and how that narrative later evolved with your collection? Thank you. Cross-culture uh, is at the bottom of my direction and my taste, really. Uh, so from the China chair, I, of course, you look into Wagner and um, you, you see his other chairs and his round back chair and his office chair, particularly with that wide wooden speck, then which requires a, a big piece of wood. And yet, you know, as he said, in the office, you better work in comfort. And it's a very comfortable office chair. And so from him, I began to look into uh, other people. And um, the uh, Metropolitan chair has a similar majestic back. Um, now, let me see what is the designer's name in Ansel uh, Bender Matson. You know, the one I have uh, um, to offer at Phillips is Pedigree. This chair has impressive pro provenance. It was a gift by cabinet maker Willie Beck, uh, whose name is inscribed underneath as per tradition to another well known maker. Peter Beach, and it remained in his family until 2012. In most of the, my collection, I care about the provenance because then you know that, I mean, it's, it's, it's always uh, to, uh, good to have association. Then you know that the chair has been in good hands. Yeah, so speaking of provenance, I mean, you, uh, you, you definitely uh, knew that this was uh, something that, that, that was important to you as a collector in, in making your decisions, um, and, and you knew where to go. But I, I guess maybe, um, well, as I said, you uh, are a pioneer as a collector uh, in Asia of this kind of material. Um, like, what, like, what advice would you give to, to others who might want to start a collection? You know, where should they be, be looking? I was very lucky because I was with the Hong Kong Design Center delegation uh, to Denmark, to, um, to Sweden, and to Finland. So I had good association and I worked with the top galleries, was very well advised. Uh, so I think it's very important to be well advised. Um, so, but 
you have to do your homework too. But but you can't learn about a new area, new direction in one year or a couple of years and be prepared to make some mistakes. Uh, and then you trade. Um, so, um, so I also learn not to be that ambitious. You concentrate in one area. And uh, now to go back, in fact, my first uh, piece was in 2008 purchased at uh, Sotheby's even before my trips to Scandinavia. I was already drawn by uh, Alba Al Alto's story because how he bent wood. So because Chinese furniture, you care about the wood. And um, the uh, curly birch, which is um, indigenous uh, to Finland, and how he used it. And that was my really my first piece of uh, collection of European furniture. Right. So, I, so, so the Alto was your very first piece of, of, yes. of, of outside of the traditional Chinese uh, uh, category. It okay. really was. It preceded even the, the Hans Wagner. And from Hans Wagner's China chair, I began a uh, dedicated uh, direction. Mm. Oh. Yeah, I mean, so, so, so you started, uh, well, you started with mid 20th century Scandinavian uh, furniture and, and, and then you sort of moved on to, um, to sort of postmodern and, 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 and contemporary. I mean, how, how did your interests sort of uh, uh, evolve into those areas? My first, I mean, my love is still with the postmodern furniture. And how did I move on to contemporary things? Is uh, like the Campana Brothers, which um, I think is very amusing. And uh, it's more than furniture, it's a, a concoction of things. Um, and so uh, the, the sushi chair is called, uh, it was purchased at the um, Philips auction uh, to raise funds for the design museum in London. Um, and so the uh, uh, Nendo chairs, you know, I saw the display in Milan and I bought them yeah. from uh, Fender in New York. And I think it's very amusing. You know, so furniture has really uh, 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 been redirected into a, a different, uh, different way um, and no more the cabinet maker. So different materials. Um, and so uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's quite amusing. Of course, I mean, uh, these days, if you, you, you look at Lars Yaman, I mean, even, you know, more um, high tech and uh, in no way do I collect that. I look at that and uh, learn about the direction, uh, which I, I don't want to follow. Well, um, but you do collect uh, Zhang Zhoujie, who is, uh, I guess, maybe China's answer to, to Joris Larman. I mean, he's a, a, a very successful designer based in Shanghai, who uh, is, is known for his algorithmically uh, designed furniture. Well, algorithmically designed, uh, digitally designed, but handcrafted, in fact. Yes, handcrafted. That's the point I like, you know, digitally designed, but handcrafted. Is still with 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 the human manipulation. Well, it, it seems like uh, maybe another thread ru running through your collection is is uh, um, uh, sort of works that kind of show uh, works that deal with a, with a sort of contrast, <laughs> right? I mean, uh, in, in 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 some in, in your interest with mid-century Scandinavian. Um, and and also in some of your other work, you're you're, you're looking at um, uh, well, not just contrast, but also where 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 binaries interact. You know, whether it's east and west, let's say, or or digital and and, and handcrafted. Uh, do you think that's fair to say? Um, yes, I, as I said, I started with like the other way, like Hans Wagner uh, looking uh, looking west, and he looked east. Um, East and West um, comparison, similarity has always been at uh, the foundation of my attention. 
So then, uh, as we said, I mean, uh, in fact, the world is completely like confluenced into one place. So that really doesn't apply so much. So anyway, um, so maybe the world is, you know, the handcrafted world has disappeared and the digitally, you know, you know um, I mean, calculated world is, um, is, is, is here. And uh, I have not collected recently, but I think my next purchase might be going back to the, um, to, to the mid 1990s, you know, and I, I decided I still like that period the best. Yeah, um, and, 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 and what, what uh, will, will tell us a little bit more about what that, period, what that period's appeal is for you. That period um, is like the transition. Um, I see the, uh, the vestiges of the traditional, the old design, be it of Chinese tradition or Scandinavian uh, tradition. And then uh, it's uh, still made for use. And even though, for example, Hans Weidner's uh, office chair, which is with that wonderful back slab of wood that you feel that you won't, don't want to slouch on it because it's valuable, it's good, but it's just, you know, it's, it's got a quality and a distinction about it. And uh, like uh, the Metropolitan Chair, which is one of my favorite, and you see that magnificent leather constructed back, you know, with this wonderful curve. It's, uh, it's grace, it's uh, quality, and it's design, and it's dignity. Yeah, well, I mean, going back to the sort of East meets West uh, idea, I, I, sh I should have mentioned that one of your uh, one of the pieces in your collection is the uh, Shao Fan chair, which is a very, a very direct <laughs> kind of expression. And in some ways, to me, it's, it's 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 very iconic of your collection and your way of thinking about um, your your collection. Can you tell us the story behind that chair and 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 how you uh, came across it? I met Shao Fan in the 1990s in Shanghai. And um, I believe his chair was done in 1997, I've forgotten. And it's number one of 70 carved at the back. So I asked him, I said, did you do 70? He said, I tried 70. I said, you don't do that in this world. It's confounding. So I don't know how many he ended up with to his satisfaction satisfactorily. But he told me just now he's proud of this one. That was his first successful example. And he uh, split the chair and, you know, Xiaofan for a very long time, his inspiration was chairs. So that really uh, this chair, uh, which you can sit on quite comfortably and um, uh, demarcates art and design and yet unites it. Yeah, I mean, I, I, my understanding is, is that, you know, Chauvin is not so much interested in making chairs, you know, as things to sit in, right? Like he's, he's, he's really approaching this um, as, as a fine artist. And, and, but, um, but I think even for um, designers who who make this who who um who who make chairs you know chairs are more than chairs right like you you had you started to talk you touched upon you know the symbolic meaning of, of chairs in, in the traditional chinese household but maybe you can tell us a little bit more about um you know more more contemporary uh, or the, the the chair as a as a more contemporary vehicle for, for different kinds of meanings. Uh, why do people collect chairs? I guess is another way of asking this. Yes, you know, why do people collect chairs? Uh, you know, in, uh, in the traditional, go back to the Chinese way, people collected chairs because it was symbolic. And most of all, according to the kind of wood it was constructed in, the desirability was in the material. But the... Um, Contemporary chairs, I mean, uh, 
mid-century even uh, 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 departed from that. And the contemporary chairs is really like a plaything. And uh, for example, like uh, the chair uh, by Damien Hurst is really, he did nothing to it except put some paint on it, but the paint matters. So the chair can be, you know, the, the, the basis of a, of, of, uh, a pictorial depi uh, depiction. Mm -hmm. So chairs um, is a vehicle that really, uh, if you go back to Xiaofan's uh, uh, chair, is a start and a, a departure point, and that was 1997, of art and design. Yeah, look, I, I, it's it, it's always uh, I, I I've always wondered, um, you know, if if in uh, in in China and, and East Asian cultures generally, I mean, uh, I, I've always wondered why there aren't more collectors of of, of contemporary um, uh, chairs and 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 design because. Um, uh, of course, in, in East Asian cultures, there was uh, historically very little distinction between fine and applied arts or fine and, and, and decorative arts, right? I mean, uh, the, the arts were, um, were very much integrated with artistic practice and, and functional objects were very much integrated. Whether you're talking about, you know, vases or or chairs or 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 or, or screens or or, or whatnot, um, and, and and so to me it's a very natural, <clears throat> it's it, it's a very natural jump <laughs> to to start seeing the the, the artistic value uh, in these other ways, functional objects. Well, if you um, go to the new chairs, um, like how do you pronounce his name? Jaris Laman. Well, it's a it's a, a, another realm again. Maybe you know more than I do it. I just look at it visually, and uh, is that the new trend to come? So you can still sit on this chair. When I last saw his exhibition, the Cooper Hewitt, and of course we couldn't sit on this chair. I long to see how comfortable. Maybe that's no longer a consideration. Right. Um, right. It's an object of. Um, it's a composition and is a realization of um, an artistic um, idea. And so, so it's another um, another uh, development or another um, of uh, chairs as no longer object as as uh, a vehicle uh, of uh, art and design combined and other elements too. Sure, sure. Now, uh, Kayan, maybe go, just going back to your collection for for for, yes. for a moment. You know, so you know, you went from classical Chinese furniture to mid twentieth century Scandinavian, uh, postmodern to and, and, and contemporary, but then you went back to mid twentieth century Japanese uh, furniture, like, like yes. modern Japanese, and especially in plywood, which. Um, kind of brings the story full circle because your first piece was the Al the Alver Alto plywood, and, and and then you were collecting yes. plywood by Sakakura and um, uh, and uh, uh, Tange. I collected those because of their provenance, you know. And the Sakakura is, uh, in fact, I looked at my notes again, and uh, I sat on the same type of chairs in this inn in north of Tokyo, in Hakone, in Yomoto. I, this inn, I just asked my friend I, where I stayed in 2007, no, no longer exists. But you imagine when I went into my tatami room and saw those chairs, and I said, wow, in situ, I could enjoy them, what they were made for. It was very special. And the Tange chairs were introduced to me. Uh, well, it's a big name. I don't usually associate it with it. Maybe he designed other chairs, but he designed it for the, is it a Bise a Memorial? So he designed the architecture as well as the interiors. So uh, they come from the original place. I don't have a lot of Japanese uh, examples. I think those were the only two because of their 
historical relevance. Okay. Now you said earlier that um, you, know, you haven't lost the collecting bug, and if you were to collect to to, uh, to acquire a next piece, it would be a mid '90s piece. You said. So yes, I. Well, actually, I'm not showing, but because I'm not selling, Adam Kormata things. I admire him very much because mm. Kormata is a Miyake, and uh, you know uh, that's an an epoch of development uh, uh, against historical uh, uh, development. Um, so uh, I also have those. And I also have Isenyaki's designs. And because I'm a historian, and these people who made history um, and who changed the course of design and history uh, is also important because they are not so, uh, like looking at the articles per se, you have to have a body of their work and to be able to understand their contribution and uh, uh, their place in. Uh, social and economic and cultural development. So you're still collecting? Not so much now, not so much now, not at such a, a pace, but I, um, I mean, I collect because of the background of the piece and, and, and the relevance to a certain idea and a certain development. Great. Well, I have to say, uh, I, for one, am looking forward to, to, to seeing uh, how your collection continues to, uh, to evolve and, and develop. And I think we are unfortunately out of time, Kayan, but really thank you so much for, for sharing uh, your th and stories about your, your really fantastic collection. Well, thank you so much because I, it, it, it was, uh, these pieces have been in storage for, for years. Then that's why I decided to part with them, to share with others. Um, so I keep very few uh, pieces, and which I enjoy, because really collecting to whoever uh, uh, may be interested in my pieces is really the story and is the marks and um, stage of interest and an epoch in your understanding of design of a country, of an area, of the time. Okay, well, it's a real treat to be able to, 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 to see the pieces and to speak with you about them. So, so, so thank you again. But anyway, first of all, and I'm so pleased that I gather there's much interest in Asia. Um, uh, Japan was the first nation for uh, collecting design. And now the interest is in Hong Kong. And I gather that Hong Kong, which include Chinese collectors, is the number one group. Of collectors. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Thank you, Great. Eric. Thank you, Kaya, and I, and I hope to see you soon. See, see you soon. Bye. Take care.